Good evening. Welcome, and thank you for coming out tonight to the Whalen Library. We are excited to have Eric Schultz here tonight to speak about King Philip's War. Eric is the author of four books, um, including the bestseller Innovation on Tap. He's a former CEO of Sensatec and CEO partner of a Ascent, Ascent? Ascent. Ascent Ventures. Pardon me. His not-for-profit positions include director of the Old Colony Historical Society and director emeritus and former chairman of both the Gettysburg Foundation and the New England Historic Genealogical Society, or American Ancestors. Thank you so much to Eric for being here. A couple of housekeeping notes. We are recording this for a possible broadcast on Wacam and our local uh, on the library's YouTube page, so you'll be able to share it around afterwards. Um, and if you are on Zoom and you have a question, just put it in the chat. I'll raise my hand and, and speak it aloud. Are we going to hold questions till the end, probably? Yeah. Okay. And I think Eric has about 45 minutes of a presentation. So help me welcome Eric Schultz. Thanks, Courtney. And welcome, everyone, and, and uh, welcome at home. Uh, thanks for coming out. Is it raining? It's raining. All right. So extra credit tonight. Uh, in the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to try to do three things. I'll tell you about the book, King Philip's War, why we wrote it, and how we think it works. We'll talk about the war itself, and then we'll talk a little bit about the legacy. And as we go along, I know all of you have a King Philip's War bookshelf at home. <laughs> I will be recommending other readings, some of them old, some of them quite new, though. There's been kind of a resurgence of interest, I think, in the last 10 years in King Philip's War. So there's some good new stuff out there. So I'm going to start with a question that I will ask you and I will answer as well. And that is, how do you access history? If you are a degreed historian, the chances are good that you value primary documents. That's the traditional way of accessing history, at least since the end of the 19th century. What did people who lived history say, even if we know they're not always reliable narrators? By the way, you may have seen last October's uh, Atlantic uh, Drew Gilbin Faust, the former president of Harvard, is teaching undergraduate students born in the, from the 1990s onward who can't read cursive. So they are very limited to the kinds of primary documents they have access to at this point. Many of us access history through secondary sources, the telling of history by historians. Many of us also access history through historical fiction. Our book club, which is 24 years old now, five couples, all still married, all still talking to each other. Just finished Daniel Mason's Northwoods, which is the history of New England told through a house in western Massachusetts. I loved it. I highly recommend that. And by the way, he mentions King Philip five or six times in that, in that book. Some of us access history through objects or artifacts. We just opened a new military room at the Old Colony History Museum in Taunton, and it's a hit because people relate to history through stuff. Even if you're not a collector, most of us have something, the engagement ring of our grandmother or a, a watch of our grandfather. It's our way of accessing the past and holding it close. And any of you who watch this program know that it's very much based on an emotional attachment to a, an artifact. And the idea is to get you to cry at the end, which quite often works. Those of you who like to dig, right, for important objects. We have an archaeologist right in front of then uh, this may be the best way to access history. If you've been to the Robbins Museum in Middleborough, you get a sense of how rich the archaeological record is in New England. And there are plenty of people who engage in genealogy. Genealogists capture family history as a way of passing on stories and traditions. And this often involves oral history, sitting down and recording a grandparent, say. And oral history becomes essential when you study something like King Philip's War, which is uh, has a written record that's so heavily weighted in one direction. And then there are folks who do reenactment. I sat on the board of Gettysburg, I mentioned. I saw Civil War reenactors arrive by the busloads uh, on the anniversary of the battle every year. Um, it, actually, reenacting became popular in the 1950s when the last of the Civil War veterans died. And at first, it was highly controversial. People were trying to have a firsthand experience when all the people who had had a firsthand experience had, go had gone. And and degreed historians hated it. But over time, they understand that this is the way people access history. It's perfectly legitimate, and it's become more acceptable. So let me add one more. And this is the reason that Mike Togus and I wrote King Philip's War. And that's accessing history by trying to create a sense of place. 
being at or near where something happened tends to be, at least for me, a really good way of understanding and enjoying history. So our book is a travelogue. It includes an 80-page history of the war just to establish chronology and context, but the heart of the book is really a focus on finding sites related to the war. We wrote King Philip's War before Google search, before GPS. That means I drove, drove all over New England and visited with local town historians, who are a gem in the crown of New England, by the way, with Native American historians and with archaeologists. And the idea was to find, visit, map, and describe the location of the garrisons, the camps, the ambushes, the battles, even if they'd been covered over by a parking lot. Why King Philip? Well, I grew up in North Dighton. The Wampanoag's Council Oak was in Central Dighton in that direction. King Philip's Oak was in Taunton in that direction. And I would come home on a bus from Dighton Rehoboth Regional High School and pass by this place called Anawan Rock. And then I got to study history at Brown. I took a material culture course with Jim Dietz, who talked all about this thing called King Philip's War. And we visited Brown's Half and Refer Museum. At th that time, it was in Bristol, Rhode Island, uh, which is the Poconocket homeland. So I grew up with the ghosts of King Philip's War all around me. And when I had the opportunity to do some research and writing around 1990, I decided that the last best thing written about the war was a generation old and had been published in 1958, Douglas Leach's Flintlock and Tomahawk. Professor Leach was not only a good historian who, who knew how to read cursive, it turns out, but he was a saint. At the time I contacted him, really out of the blue, he was a professor emeritus at Vanderbilt in his 70s and battling leukemia, which I did not know. Despite that, he took our entire manuscript, manuscript, read it, and edited it. So the language, some of the language in Flintlock and Tomahawk, you're going to find a little dated. But I still think it's the best single history of King Philip's War and a great place to start if you don't know anything about the war. All right, so let me provide some of that context for you. The Pilgrims land in 1620. The American Revolution begins in 1776. And King Philip's War was fought in southern New England in 1675 and 6, and then continued in northern New England through what was called the Treaty of Casco in 1678. The war pitted, we think, maybe 60,000 English against about 20,000 indigenous peoples. And that number varies depending on who you read, but it's probably a pretty good estimate. And they had occupied the land, of course, for thousands of years. And by the way, as long as we've got a timeline up, I should point out that next year is the 350th anniversary of the war. It's the beginning of this larger pattern of conflict that will determine whether the English or the Dutch or the French or the Native Americans will possess this part of North America. So King Philip's War will be followed by a series of wars, all of which lead up to the American Revolution. The three Native American tribes that will prosecute the war in southern New England are the Wampanoag, which include Philip's people, the Poconocket, based around Bristol and Warren, Rhode Island, Weetamos Pocasset in Fall River and Tiverton, and Awashonk Sakonet in Little Compton. The Narragansett in modern-day Rhode Island, the strongest of all the Native American tribes when the war begins. And then later to the north, whoops, and then the Nipmuc in central Massachusetts. And then later to the north, the Abenaki. To get to 20,000, you'd add the Penacook, the Pequot, the Mohican, the Becumtuck, the Massachusetts, and those Native Americans who made their home on the Cape and the islands. So Massachusetts won't exist until 1692, New Hampshire until 1776, and Maine until 1820. So at the time of King Philip's War, there is Plymouth Colony, what we call today the Old Colony, and that is led by Governor Josiah Winslow. Massachusetts Bay Colony, a half or more of New England's population resides there. That's led by Governor John Leverett. And unlike most of the soldiers in King Philip's War who were really farmers, Leverett was a real soldier. He fought under Cromwell with distinction. And then Connecticut was led by Governor John Winthrop, Jr. They called him Winthrop the Younger to differentiate him from his father, who established the settlement at Saybrook that launched that colony. And then there was this ragtag bunch of malcontents in a place called Rhode Island who will also contribute to the war effort. In 1675, the Mass Bay frontier settlements included Dunstable, Groton, Lancaster, Marlborough, Menden, Medfield, and Rentham. Then there were these two isolated outposts, Worcester, which had about seven families, and Brookfield, which had about 20. And then there was a string of exposed settlements along the Connecticut River Valley, from Northfield and Deerfield down to Springfield. For Plymouth Colony, Bridgewater and Taunton were inland and exposed, but the real frontier towns 
where Dartmouth, Swansea, and Rehoboth. And then you might say all of Connecticut, all of Rhode Island, all of modern day Maine and New Hampshire, right up to Pemaquid, were all frontier. Okay, so let's look at some of the key individuals involved in the coalition of indigenous peoples that will prosecute this war. The older woman in the center of this picture is Zervia Gould. Right, she was born in 1807. She married Thomas Mitchell in 1824. They had 11 children. And here she is with two of her daughters, Melinda and Carlotte. Zervia lived much of her life on Betty's Neck in Lakeville. In 1856, she began a campaign to assert her rights to four lots of land in Fall River. And to make her case to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, she needed to show her direct connection to Massasoit, her direct genealogical connection, who, of course, is the Wampanoag Sachem who greets the pilgrims. So she partnered with a local historian by the name of Ebenezer Pierce, who in 1878 published Indian History, Biography, and Genealogy. It's a monograph containing a history of King Philip's War, one of the few doc documents written thanks to Zervaya with more of a Native American perspective. It also has a biography and a genealogy of Massasoit, and you can find and read this book online for free. This is a simplified version of Massasoit's genealogy as it's laid out by Pearson Gould. Massasoit was a title, meaning Grand Sachem. Usamequin was his name. We believe he had at least five children, but given the estimates of his age, this family might have been a second family. It's possible his first family was wiped out by plague. Uh, we now think that as much as 90% of the Native American population was wiped out in the century before the pilgrims landed. And the military has this concept called shaping the battlefield, which is the process of slowing and degrading the enemy force before the battle begins. There's nothing that shaped the battlefield for King Philip's War like European disease. Another important factor was what historians now call the Great Puritan Migration. 1630, Charles I dissolved Parliament. Puritan leaders were more subject to persecution, so their response was to organize the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And the Winthrop fleet led the way. More than 20,000 men, women, and children migrated over the next decade. It also turned out that conditions in the New World were healthier than the cities of Europe for raising a large family. So beginning in the 1620s, America had its first baby boom. New England's indigenous peoples weren't just crippled by European disease. They also faced a population that was growing rapidly by birth, and they began to recognize the existence of this thing we now know as a supply chain that stretched back to a world that seemed to have an endless flow of people and resources. Massasoit's oldest son was Wampsutta, or Alexander. He married Witamo. We'll say more about Wampsutta in a minute. Witama will drown in the Taunton River at Somerset, trying to escape English soldiers in August of 1676, just before Philip is killed. And her head was stuck on a pike in Taunton. It was a gruesome tactic that both sides used to strike fear in their enemy. Lisa Brooks is a professor of American studies at Amherst College, and her book, Our Beloved Kin, takes an especially good look at the role that Witama played, a role that has been traditionally overlooked and underappreciated. And Professor Book, Brooks, as I mentioned at the beginning, is one of these new generation of historians who believe that the voices of the indigenous peoples can be heard in many besides the written record, in their alliances, in their use of land, in their kinship and family ties. Massasoit also had a daughter, Amy, who married Tispaquin, who will fight in the war alongside Philip. Zervaya Gould Mitchell was descended from Amy, so that's the genealogical line that's documented in Pierce's monograph. If you visit Lakeville, you can find a beautiful and important graveyard, the Royal Wampanoag Cemetery. It includes some of Massasoit's descendants through Amy's line. And it's an old cemetery. The last burial was in 1812. By the way, Zervaya is tenacious. She's, she's courageous. She convinces Massachusetts of her lineage and her claims, and she wins the rights to the land in Fall River. Massasoit's second son was Metacom, or Philip, who became known by the, by the English as King Philip. Sachem was not a king, but it's the imprecise term that they used. And it was the English who gave the name Philip to Metacom and Alexander to Wampsutta, which both men accepted. Perhaps it was a sign of respect. We're really not sure. Metacom married Witamo's sister, Wutanak Knusk, and the couple may have had two daughters, but we're sure they had a son who, our history books say, was sold into Caribbean slavery with his mother after King Philip's War. There's an oral tradition that Philip's son slipped over the side of the ship and escaped to Canada. So there are people who claim descent from 
to soy it, not only through his daughter Amy, but through Philip and his son. And it's not entirely unusual for me to receive a letter like this every so often. If you start right here, my great-grandfather was born in Mott Niles, Michigan in 1873, and when he was 95 in 1968, he told my mother we were direct descendants of King Philip, and he didn't want the family to forget it, but to pass it on. So the descent from Massasoit through Philip is sometimes called the Royal House of Poconocket. Brown University is home to a new initiative called Stolen Relations. It's a community-based collaborative effort to build a database of enslaved and unfree indigenous people across all the Americas. The project has a very impressive lineup of partners, and it has a very good website if you want to learn more. In 1661, Massasoit died of natural causes after presiding over 40 years of peace with the English. The peace was made, by, was made more difficult many factors, alcohol, the sale of firearms, aggressive Protestant evangelism, the inequitable treatment of indigenous peoples under English law, and by land. Land was always at the center of this tension. But having said that, it was 40 years of diplomacy and 40 years of peace. David Silverman's This Land is Their Land makes the case that Massasoit and the English each leveraged one another politically to gain advantage. Silverman is also part of this historical movement that is working hard to recover the voices of indigenous people. I mentioned Lisa Brooks's uh, Our Beloved Kin. I would also add Christine DeLucia's Memory Lands and Ned Blackhawk's The Rediscovery of America. They are all part of this new way of interpreting King Philip's War that I think balances the written record with other ways of hearing native voices. I recommend to you this excellent program sp sponsored by this library and the First Parish of Whalen and the Towns Historical Society. A number of scholars are on the program, including Christine DeLucia. I would also recommend this excellent interview with Lisa Brooks. Between these two videos, you'll get a really good sense of how these historians are engaging and reinterpreting the war. Okay, at Massasoit's death, his eldest son, Wampsutta, became Grand Sachem. The following year, in 1662, Wampsutta was forcibly taken from his hunting lodge on Montpossett Ponds in present-day Halifax by Josiah Winslow, who will become the future governor. Wampsutta was marched to meet with officials on charges of the unauthorized sale of land and rumors of an armed uprising with the Narragansett. The new sachem apparently acquitted himself well, but became suddenly ill and died while returning to his home in Warren, Rhode Island. We really don't know what happened. One modern doctor said that Wampsutta's symptoms resembled appendicitis, but Philip and many of the Poconocket believed that Wampsutta had been poisoned by the English because they concluded he had become an obstacle to their acquisition of land. Wampsutta's hunting lodge was located near White Island in Halifax. There's a historical marker at White Island Road, Route 58, commemorating the capture. The next important event leading up to the war was the so-called Taunton Agreement, signed at the meeting house at present-day Church Green. This so-called agreement required Philip to give up his guns, a condition he undoubtedly agreed to only under threat and which he would never honor. The scene of this meeting is depicted in the New England Mutual Life Insurance Company's 1900 promotional calendar. It's a beautiful engraving, but it's not particularly historical as Philip is dressed like a 19th century Plains Indian. This illustration was done, by the way, by Frank Thayer Mer Merrill, who was born in Roxbury, had his studio there, and who trained at the MFA. He is best known for his drawings for the first illustrated edition of Louisa May Alcott's Little Women, which was published in 1880. And if you visit the Museum of the Ancient and Honorable Artillery Company at Faneuil Hall, it's a sort of nondescript elevator, uh, you can see a painting of the Taunton Agreement as well there. The third event, the one that really triggered the war, came about at the death of John Sassamon. Sassamon was a fascinating guy. He was a member of the Massachusetts, attended Harvard, fought with the English in the Pequot War in 1636, converted to Christianity, a so-called praying Indian, and served as a translator for Wampsutta and then for Philip. He was discovered in January of 1675 under the ice at Assawampsett Pond in Lakeville. First, his death was ruled as an accident. He'd been ice fishing and fallen in. Then the English heard from an informer and came to believe it was murder. You can actually see the informer back there by the tree in this sketch. Plymouth held a trial, very much a kangaroo court. Three of Philip's men were convicted and hanged, probably none of them guilty. So John Sassamon's trial will be the event that will convince Philip if the possible poisoning of his brother 
and the coerced Taunton Agreement hadn't already, that he will never receive justice from the English. This trial is well documented. It's fascinating. Dr. Kawashima, a historian and legal scholar at the University of Texas, wrote a book about the events surrounding the trial and the nature of English justice more generally as it applied to indigenous peoples. There's once upon a time a place uh, called King Philip Tavern, built near the spot of the alleged murder. It burned to the ground in 1919. I had a FedEx driver come up to me uh, at one point and say he'd driven by that spot in the lake for 20 years and had never seen it frozen. So it was, was a reminder that our ancestors endured something called the Little Ice Age, which was a regional cooling period from about the 14th to the mid 19th century when temperatures were on average about one degree F cooler. We describe about 50 sites related to the war in our book. I'll only touch on some of those sites tonight, but I would offer you this word of caution, what I'll call my Washington slept here warning. There are many sites and artifacts attributed to King Philip. Rocks, lots of caves, lookouts, even chairs. Just be appropriately skeptical. Here's an example. This was King Philip's Oak. I mentioned that it grew on Somerset Avenue in Taunton in 1926. The Daughters of the American Revolution placed a plaque on the tree commemorating, as, commemorating it as a spot where Philip and his people met. In 1973, the tree started to drop limbs, and a decade later, Taunton's Park Department was forced reluctantly to take it down. People were upset. Of course, it was, it was a direct living link to King Philip, but when they counted the rings on this beautiful old tree, they found that it had been planted about a century after Philip died. Occasionally, someone will ask me what Philip looked like. The answer is we don't know. There was no contemporaneous image made of him. There are lots and lots of images out there of Philip. The one in the middle is owned by the Haffenreffer Museum, and they were kind enough to allow Mike and me to use it on the cover of our first edition. Some of the images of Philip are striking. The painting in the middle was done by Thomas Hart Benton in 1922. And over time, I have developed kind of a, uh, I'll call it a back of the envelope theory of how Philip has been treated through the course of American history. First, he was demonized. Puritan minister William Hubbard, who wrote uh, an important history, refers to him as a savage miscreant. Benjamin Church calls him a doleful, great, naked, dirty beast. This kind of description of the enemy is hardly uncommon in warfare. After the American Revolution, when fighting to protect your homeland turned out to be a pretty good thing to do, he was romanticized. So in 1829, for example, John Augustus Stone wrote Metamora, or The Last of the Wampanoag, starring Edwin Forrest. In this telling of King Philip's War, Metacom is heroic and noble. The play earned record profits for theaters around the country. And then after being demonized and romanticized, Philip was commercialized. And he wasn't alone. Once the indigenous peoples were no longer felt to be a threat in the late 19th century, they were co-opted by Madison Avenue as brands in consumer marketing. So images of Philip were used to sell pickles, beer, and chewing gum coffee and tobacco. You can tell I spent a little too much time on eBay. <laughs> Cigars, banks, clipper ship services, and even Post and Kellogg cereal. And as you can see on these labels, marketeers in the 20th century were doing what New England Mutual did in its 1900 calendar, relying on Geronimo or Sitting Bull or some other 19th century model for their image of a 17th century sachem. The most recent image of Metacom that I found is a mural painted in the open area beside the 133 Club in East Providence. And I could not get that Mercedes to move, so I took the picture. <laughs> the most famous of Philip's images was done by Paul Revere in 1772. It's not very flattering, and historians wondered where Revere had dreamed this up. About 200 years later, Brad Swan, who was the president of the Rhode Island Historical Society, was visiting the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester and spotted this mezzotint hanging on the wall called the Four Kings of Canada. It's a display of four Mohawk chiefs done about 1710. Here are just two of them. What Revere did was what we would call today a mashup. He borrowed and mixed elements from each to create his own version of King Philip. So we don't know what Philip looked like. And we also don't know that much about Philip's thinking during the war. We're not always sure where he is or what role he played. And in any event, it's not at all clear that he'd given up on diplomacy and wanted war in 1675. And it seems unlikely, at the very least, that he would have launched a war in the middle of the growing season. <laughs> 
So when the war began in Swansea in June of 1675, it was possibly or probably without Philip's blessing. On June 1st, the Sassamon verdicts were delivered in Plymouth Colony. On the 8th, the first executions were carried out. On June 19th, the home of Job Winslow was vandalized by Poconocket warriors. He was the nephew of the governor. On June 20th, the band of Poconocket loot and set fire to several homes at Kickamuit in Swansea. And then on June 21st, Governor Winslow ordered 200 troops to assemble from Taunton and Bridgewater in that area. And then on June 23rd, I suppose you can say the war began when the Poconocket continued their looting and one of the English, John Salisbury, shot one of the Poconocket who would subsequently die. So on June 24th, in retaliation, Salisbury and eight others were killed and their heads placed on pikes. Very quickly, the old Miles Garrison in Swansea became the center of action. Unfortunately, the structure is now gone. This picture on the right is from 1906. Everywhere that I mention a 1906 picture, the image comes from this 1906 book by a pair of Connecticut River historians, George Ellis and John Morris. It is as readable as Leach, not quite as detailed, with a little more emphasis placed on events in the Connecticut River Valley. And it has these wonderful pictures. And if you are a sense of place person like I am, it's really fun to see and read. And I have a feeling that when Leach wrote his book, he looked back to find the last best thing written, and it was this in 1906. So it had been uh, 50 years before he, he did Flintlock and uh, Tomahawk. You can visit the spot of the Miles Garrison today, of course. There's a marker near the intersection of Old Providence and Barneyville Roads. From this point on, events begin to take on a life of their own. English troops try to trap Philip on the Mount Hope Peninsula, but he's too fast, he's too smart, and the English are just too tentative at the start of the war. We now know that the Native Americans readily adopted the flintlock prior to the war and used it frequently for hunting. They acquired this technology from the French and the Dutch and from the English who weren't supposed to sell guns to the natives, but did anyway. Meanwhile, the English farmers turned soldiers generally possessed the older, less reliable matchlock technology. So the natives were probably more skilled with a superior European technology than the English. They knew the land better, and the fighting is going to bear that out. Patrick Malone is a professor emeritus at Brown who wrote an excellent treatise on how warfare might have unfolded in King Philip's War. Taunton was first attacked June 1675. Several townsmen are killed, but the first and most famous was Edward Bobbitt, or the Babbitt family, who was living in modern-day Berkeley. At the first sign of trouble in Swansea, Bobbitt had been able to walk his wife and nine children to the safety of the garrisons closer to Taunton Green. However, the story goes, he and a dog returned to their home to get a cheese press, of all things. They were spotted by Poconocket. Edward climbed a tree out of sight but his dog barked and gave him away, and Bobbitt was killed. His neighbors placed a crude gravestone near the spot, which is now in the collection of the Old Colony History Museum. The stone is still prominently displayed. If you drive along Berkeley Street, there is a marker that shows the original spot of the Bobbitt stone. By the way, the original stone was used later to build a stone wall, and the Babbitt family had to rescue it from that wall in the early part of the 20th century. It is a good reminder. Someone didn't want to pick up another rock and move it. So it's just a good reminder of how fragile our history is and how it can be lost to the daily requirements of living. In July of 1675, now the following month, Middleborough was attacked. The townspeople had gathered for protection at the old fort, which was near the former Memorial High School. Their leader was John Thompson, and Thompson brought along his so-called long gun, which is a seven foot four inch fowling piece. It was so heavy it was designed to be placed in a fork. As the story is told, the natives would appear daily on the southeasterly side of the Namaskat River and ascend what was called Hand Rock on Barden Hill because it had the impression of a man's hand in it. And there they would be in sight of the fort and the Indians would harass and try to discourage the English. They did this for several days. So Thompson ordered Isaac Howland, who was his best marksman, to take the long gun and just shoot in the general direction of the natives as a way to answer their insults. When Howland shot, the story goes, he hit and killed one of the natives. The distance was later measured at a half a mile. We think that a following gun like Thompson's could shoot maybe 100 yards. So we put this story in the category of myth or tall tale, but the gun is real and often visited by collectors. You can see it right next to the Bobbit stone there. Hand Rock exists as well. It's a beautiful petroglyph carved on the rock. It's on private property now, so you have to ask permission to see it. 
If you have an interest in petroglyphs, then there are several hand carvings in Middleborough, along with Hand Rock, also on Betty's Neck in Lakeville and in North Kingston, Rhode Island. We're not sure exactly what they were used for. Property markers, decorations, art, but they are beautifully done. They're real crafts. Edward Lenick wrote an excellent article in the spring 2016 Massachusetts Archaeological Society Bulletin about this topic. <clears throat> Also in July, Menden was attacked, which is a big deal because it's the first town in Massachusetts Bay that's attacked. So both colonies are now fully involved. The Nipmuc lead this attack. So they are now in the war alongside the Wampanoag, and they bring numbers and they bring very able commanders. Governor Leverett was not fully convinced that the Nipmuc had joined the war on the side of the Wampanoag, so he sent a negotiating party under Captains Edward Hutchinson and Thomas Wheeler to meet with the Nipmuc in what is today New Braintree, Massachusetts. Their party was ambushed, eight were killed and five wounded. Wheeler survived and a few months later wrote a first-hand account of the ambush. It has enough clues to allow historians over the years to propose at least three locations for the ambush. Mike Togas and I included Wheeler's first-hand account in our book. Local historian Jeff Fisk wrote a careful review of all the clues as well. The survivors of the ambush raced back to Quabog Plantation in today's West Brookfield along Foster Hill Road. The Nipmuc were right behind. They laid siege to the heirs' garrison. The siege was made famous by Puritan clergy historians who were looking for any angle possible at this point to tell a favorable story about the English. And that is the natives had lit a cart on fire and to push it into the uh, garrison to force the, uh, the English out. And at the last minute, the rain fell and put the fire out. <clears throat> the sites associated with the plantation and siege are well marked along Foster Hill Road in West Brookfield, including the location of the heir's garrison. And in the late 19th century, marketeers attempted to cash in on the romance of King Philip's War by bottling water for upscale diners in Boston and New York City hotels. By the fall of 1675, the action had moved to the exposed settlements along the Connecticut River Valley with the Pocomtech now joining the Wampanoag and Nipmuc. In September, Captain Richard Beers of Watertown and 36 mounted men led an ox team removing food and supplies from Squawkeeg Plantation, which is modern Northfield, which had been attacked and burned. Beers and his men were ambushed. They lost 21 men. As you can imagine, it was a very dark day for the English. And that tragedy was followed by another ambush, this time at Muddy Brook, which will forever be called Bloody Brook in modern-day South Deerfield. Captain Thomas Lathrop from Beverly and 79 soldiers, mostly from Essex County, were sent to evacuate Deerfield. Remember, they've just harvested, so all the food is sitting there. The soldiers and Teamsters stopped to rest and were ambushed. The Nipmuc under Mutwump killed 40 soldiers and 17 Teamsters. It was another devastating event for the English in terms of human loss and, of course, the loss of food. And at this point in the fall of 1675, there was a sense among the English that the Native Americans might very well push 50 years of colonial settlement back to the beaches of the Atlantic. There's a marker showing the mass grave of Lathrop's soldiers and Teamsters. The site was discovered many years after the event. This commemorative part of this home is considered the oldest surviving monument to veterans in the United States. And in 1838, the site was commemorated with an inscribed memorial. Edward Everett was the keynote speaker. You may know that name. He'd been the governor of Massachusetts, and except for Daniel Webster, was considered the greatest order of his day. To give you some sense for how important Bloody Brook and King Philip's War were in the 19th century, Everett was also the keynote speaker at the dedication of the Lexington Concord Battlefields at Bunker Hill to raise money to save Mount Vernon, and then one day, he would deliver 13,000 words at a place called Gettysburg just before Lincoln delivered his 272 words. The first year closed with the single bloodiest day of the war. The Great Swamp Fight occurred on a snowy day in December of 1675. A thousand-man army that included all three colonies, Rhode Island and about 150 friendly Mohegan warriors, attacked a palisaded Narragansett village of men, women, and children in the Great Swamp in South Kingston, Rhode Island. The Puritan historians believe that the fort was unfinished and the English entered it by a fallen tree at an exposed opening. It seems more obvious to me that this entrance was intentionally created by Canachet, the Narragansett commander, to ensure that a larger and stronger force would have to attack single file. 
And that's what happened. The English breached the fort, but they were driven back. They breached it a second time and were driven back, and they finally entered the fort in force. Once the fighting moved within the fort, the English set it on fire. Everything was destroyed, shelter, food, supplies. We think as many as 400 women and children were killed. The Narragansett, who had not entered the war, considered this attack unprovoked and a massacre of innocents. This depiction of the Great Swamp Fight on the right ha also hangs in Faneuil Hall in the Museum of the Ancient and Honorable Artillery Society. The site of the Great Swamp Fight is marked today by an obelisk, and there is a long-standing debate about whether we have actually found the correct location of the battle. There have been artifacts found at this site. There was a sketch done by Yale President Ezra Stiles when he visited the site in 1782. But when archaeologists dug test pits, which they did in the late 50s and early 1960s, the pits did not contain the kind and amount of rich remains you would expect to find in a palisaded village of maybe a thousand people. There are archaeologists and there are Narragansett who say they know the correct spot, but they won't reveal it because they consider it sacred. When I researched the book, this is years ago, so this is not a drone. I'm up in a plane and wasn't happy about it, but I took these pictures. You can see a change in the foliage, which indicates a change in the species of the trees, which in this case indicates about five acres of upland or drier, sandier soil surrounded by swamp. There are at least a dozen areas of upland in the swamp, and it stands to reason that the Narragansett Fort would have been built on one of them, assuming the water table hasn't changed dramatically. A few years ago, my wife and I were able to purchase artifacts found at the traditional location of the Great Swamp Fight by descendants of the Clark family that owned and farmed the area around the obelisk. In the early part of the 20th century, I understand you could get off a train in Kingston, walk over to the farm, pay a quarter, they would give you a shovel, and you could dig all day to your heart's content. And we donated these artifacts to the New England Historic Genealogical Society. In February of 1676, Lancaster was attacked, and the minister's wife, Mary Rowlandson, was captured. And Mary would travel with the natives for 11 weeks. During that time, she met Philip, she met Witamo, and she would be among the first to understand that despite a series of impressive military victories, the Native Americans were growing desperate and hungry, often winning on the battlefield, but losing the war of attrition. The site of the Rowlandson garrison used to be marked by this pine tree, that's 1906, was still hanging on, you can see when I visited about 1991, on the grounds of Atlantic Union College. The school closed in 2018, and the pine tree is now gone. If you want to visit the spot where Mary was released by the natives or redeemed, you can hike the Mid-State Trail on Wachusett Mountain and visit Redemption Rock. Springtime brought the Sudbury fight, another devastating loss for the English and what we now think of as the last attack, at least in the east, and the dying gasp of the native coalition. And now, of course, we're in Wayland. I'm not going to visit your town and presume to teach you any of its history, uh, but you know better than me, but I'll give you just a couple of data points. Sudbury Plantation is incorporated in 1639. That grant would eventually become Wayland, Sudbury, Maynard, Stowe, Framingham, and Natick. And Wayland was the first settlement on the plantation. I think you have a sign that says that. By 1643, there's settlements to the west and there's some kind of crossing. So when Mass Bay celebrated its 300th anniversary in 1930, it commissioned 275 of these cast iron markers. You still see them. A lot of them are down. Some of them were stolen. Some of them have been refurbished. Many of them don't read the way we'd like them to read anymore. But Wayland and Sudbury got five of them, which is a pretty good haul, right? And two of them specifically mentioned King Philip's War. The Reverend Francis Wayland, for whom your town is named, was all already known to me because I passed under the Wayland Arch a million times in my four years at Brown, where he was the fourth president. And one of the two English commanders in the Sudbury fight is Captain Samuel Brocklebank, one of the early settlers of Rowley, whose home is now a beautiful museum owned by the Georgia Society. So at this point, Groton and Lancaster have been evacuated. Marlborough has been mostly evacuated, although there are English troops stationed there. And Sudbury is the uh, most exposed frontier town. And the natives who are camped around Wachusett know this, and several hundred of them, the estimate is as much as 500, decide to attack the town. Wadsworth and Brocklebank, who were in Marlborough, marched their troops into town. They were ambushed. They regathered, and they fought their way up Green Hill. 
Other soldiers tried to reach them. A group from Concord was wiped out in full view of everyone on the, on the hill. A group of Christian Indians from Charlestown was unable to reach them. And after about four hours of fighting, Wadsworth troops had reached the top of the hill with very little loss in what looked like a defensible position. But this time, the natives set the hill on fire. And in the ensuing fire and smoke and chaos and retreat, Wadsworth, Brocklebank, and some 30 of their men are killed. The English soldiers were buried in a mass grave in what is today the Wadsworth Cemetery in Sudbury. This is a picture of how it looked in 1906. Captain Wadsworth's son, Benjamin, was six years old when his father died. In 1725, Benjamin had become the eighth president of Harvard. And in 1730, he added this beautiful slate stone in memory of his father and Captain Brocklebank and their men. In 1835, the cemetery was created around this old burial spot, and on the 175th anniversary of the battle, this tall commemorative obelisk was dedicated. On April 18, 1876, a bicentennial celebration was held, and a 44-page commemorative booklet produced. I assume that booklet was within a chip shot of where we're standing. The oration was given by Harvard President Edward J. Young, and then in 1897, the Society of Colonial Wars paid a visit to the cemetery to commemorate the Sudbury fight. The event was, uh, featured a number of direct descendants of the soldiers. One of the keynote speakers was George Madison Bodge. He was a minister in Boston. He was chaplain of the uh, Society of Colonial Wars. And Bodge wrote one of the more important books about the war, published in 1906 for some reason, in which he transcribed the payment records of John Hull, who was the treasurer of Mass Bay during the war. So it's full of names and really helpful if you are a genealogist. If you are like me and you troll across eBay once a day or every so often, this is one of the more common postcards of Wayland that's available. And the Boston Globe ran an article about King Philip's War and the Sudbury fight in 1876 as part of that 200th anniversary, showing this illustration of the Haynes garrison. So the Sudbury fight ends the major military engagements of the war in the Eastern Theater. There's one other I would mention to you, a major military engagement in the West at modern-day Turner's Falls in Montague. William Turner is a tailor from Boston, not a soldier. He's suffering from what was called a malignant cold. His troops were young and inexperienced. They decide to ambush a native camp uh, at night, and they end up slaughtering a number of native women and children. But in the ensuing retreat, they hadn't planned it very well, and Turner is killed as well as a number of his men. It is a dreadfully as executed military program. It results in a great loss of life, but the whole fiasco breaks the back of Native resistance in the West and ends the fighting in the Connecticut River Valley. In the late spring of 1676, this is where we are. Dozens of English towns had been attacked. Seventeen were destroyed and abandoned. Colonial troops had been devastated by ambushes. Major Appleton from Ipswich had been able to secure the Connecticut River Valley, but only after Beer's ambush and Bloody Brook and the Turner's Falls fight, some of the worst days of the war for the English. Puritan historians are going to count the Great Swamp fight as a win, but that was very wishful thinking. The English suffered 70 dead, 150 wounded, and this unprovoked attack brought the Gansett, who had been neutral so far, into the war. Losses like the Sudbury fight looked very bad for the English, and certainly in the coffee houses in London, our revered forefathers were being cast as these bumbling bureaucrats. And in truth, the natives were losing the underlying war. Harvest had been impossible in 1675. Planting was impossible in 1676. They had been forced from their traditional fishing grounds, and there was hunger everywhere among the natives. They had talented blacksmiths. They could repair guns, but they were running out of gunpowder, and they had no way to make that. The natives were also running out of warriors. And when Kanachet was captured in the spring of 1676, they were running out of military leaders as well. The death blow comes in August of 1676 when Philip was shot and killed at Mount Hope in Bristol, Rhode Island, by a band of soldiers under Benjamin Church. Ironically, it was a Native American by the name of Alderman who killed Philip. One of Philip's hands had been scarred in an accident with a musket, and the scar made the hand identifiable. So Church cut it off and gave it to Alderman, who would preserve it in a bucket of rum and make his living by exhibiting the hand for pennies at taverns around New England. Phillips' head was sent to Plymouth and exhibited on a pike on a main thoroughfare for what we think was maybe 25 years. 
The spot of Philip's death in Bristol is marked, as is the rock formation nearby called the Seat of Metacom. Not long after Philip's death, Church and his men captured Anawan in modern-day Rehoboth. It's a heroic scene in Church's history. He had to carefully climb down this rock face in the dead of night. But it's also worth remembering Anawan was elderly. He had been Massasoit's war chief and contemporary. So he was 80-something. He's leading mostly women and children who are outgunned and probably starving. We think that as Church grew older, he visited Anawan Rock from his home in Little Compton to show the scene to his family members. It's still an interesting place to visit and easily accessible off Route 44. Finally, there's the mystery of the belts. When Anwan was captured, he presented Church with two wampum belts. Church described them in some detail. One was nine inches broad, black and white wampum, flowers, birds, and beasts, edged with red hair from Mohawk country. There had been a Mohawk war going on at the same time. Church sent these belts to Governor Winslow, who in 1677 sent them to King Charles II. And he sent them courtesy of his brother, so Winslow's brother-in-law, Major Waldgrave Pelham. The belts never made it to the king, and Pelham is the key suspect. A group traveling to England in the 1970s tried to find them. Doc Robbins at the Mass Archaeological Society was working on locating them and thought he had, right up to his death in 1990. In 1993, a photo surfaced of wampum belts held by the British Museum. But two years later, the British government was simply unable to find them. So I am sure these belts exist. There was a beautiful belt created a few years ago in homage to the missing belts, part of an exhibit at the Cahoon Museum of American Art in Ketuit. Losses from King Philip's War on both, sides were stag from both, on both sides were staggering. The English experienced 800 deaths, or about 1,500 deaths per 100,000 people, while the natives experienced death at 10 times that rate. King Philip's War is sometimes referred to as the bloodiest war per capita in American history. As important, these combined losses ended forever a way of life of two peoples living peacefully side by side for 50 years in New England. Some Native Americans fled to New York and Canada. Those that took up arms against the English were generally executed. Many indigenous people were sold into slavery in Bermuda and the West Indies. It was a way the English had of ensuring that there would never be another uprising and a way of paying for the war. It was also important to know that there were survivors who remained in New England. There is an unbroken history here, contrary to what are sometimes called erasure narratives that were common after the war. Bottom line is this, King Philip's War will become a template for the forceful removal of indigenous peoples from the land. King Charles II and the British administrators were appalled that New England bureaucracy bureaucrats could not keep the native population in check and almost lost King Philip's War. So shortly after the war, the crown began tightening governance around a part of the world it had almost ignored for 50 years. Among other actions, it forced the Treaty of Casco in 1678 to end the war and lumped Mass Bay and Plymouth together in something called the province of Massachusetts. From the colonists' perspective, they had just fought a war with zero support from the, from the mother country and won pretty happy about governing themselves for 50 years. Things were going okay as far as they were concerned. So they will resist this tightening for the next century. And you can see the seeds of the American Revolution being planted in the wake of King Philip's War. And finally, there's the shoddy treatment of veterans, another legacy of King Philip's War. As Mass Bay and Plymouth uh, Colony soldiers were mustering on Dedham Plain, which is now the Hyde Park neighborhood in Boston, before the Great Swamp Fight, Governor Leverett sent a message that said if they took the fort, they would also be paid a gratuity of land along with their wages. That was December of 1675. Well, they did take the fort, and unfortunately it would take Massachusetts 59 years until 1734 before veterans and their heirs received the land promised in 1675. And I say heirs because many of the veterans, of course, had died by 1734. There were seven Narragansett townships established, towns that were first settled by the veterans of the Great Swamp Fight or their children. Genealogically speaking, this information can be of great value. If your ancestors are from this area, land grant number two may be most relevant, the grant that became Westminster, Mass., at the foot of Mount Wachusett. This was closest to Boston and considered the best of all the grants. You might note that grant number four, Greenwich, Mass., was flooded by the Quabbin Reservoir and no longer exists. And you can see from Bodge's meticulous lists of Hull's lists, here are the names of the soldiers or their heirs from Sudbury who received grants. 
The nice thing about this list too is this, if the veteran was dead and the oldest son had died, the daughter gets the land. So there are a number of women mentioned in these lists as well. <clears throat> of course, in this day and age, if you want to know the significance and legacy of King Philip's War, you simply ask chat GPT and it will spit out the answer in eight seconds. Eight seconds. It's not a bad answer. I subscribe to it because I guess you'd say uh, I can't help being a dinosaur, but I don't want to become a fossil yet. And let's be a little more traditional, though, and do a quick review of your possible expanded reading list. Along the top, we mentioned Bodge, Pearson Gould's monograph, which is online, Leach, Ellison Morse, and Kawashima's look at the trial of John Sassamon. If you are new to the war, I would start with Leach. And then along the bottom, we also talked about some of the important historians looking to recover the voices of indigenous peoples, which is another way of saying, turn them from names into real people who had hopes and dreams and kids and wanted a future like just like the rest of us. If you're interested in texts written by participants or, or observers of the war, these four are the ones where we sort, that we sourced most actively to create a sense of place. Increase Mather's history, he was Cotton's father. Increase will be most closely associated with the Salem witch trials. Mary Rowlandson's captivity account, Benjamin Church's account of the war, which is recorded by his son Thomas. And the best of the lot, which is Reverend William Hubbard's history. He was the minister at Ipswich. The most famous of the King Philip's War books in the last generation, Bill Lepore's The Name of War. Of course, it won the Bancroft Prize. I really like it. I don't recommend it as your starter book because you want a clear view of chronology, I think, before you start. She really focuses on the role of language in shaping perceptions of the war and collective memory. Some of what she writes is at odds with the new historians. I know Jill a little. I've read many of her books. I've seen her in action. She is a formidable historian and does not me need me to defend her work. Her book is a great addition to your King Philip's War bookshelf. And of course, there is only one book about King Philip's War that I recommend you purchase in great quantity, <laughs> give to all of your friends, put a copy in your glove compartment of your car just in case you drive by one of the sites. Uh, and with that shameless bit of self-promotion, I'll stop here and thank you all for coming tonight. I'm happy to take questions or comments or...